listening to Dream State by Matt McCarthy. Produced by Tynan Media. Dream State is intended for mature audiences. Episode 1. Mayday. 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 This is Colonel Gwendolyn Uskford and Captain James Tyndale, Federal Office of Internal Affairs, case number E46-12-3207. Today is October 29, 2021, and this is interview FIA-01. With a subject, please state their rank and name for the record and verify the date. Federal Internal Affairs Officer Natalia DeVore, October 29th, 2021. Officer DeVore, when did you first become involved with the organization known as CONCH? May 1st of this year, the day the Kennedy girl went missing. Mayday, mayday, mayday. <laughs> That's when I was with Luke, Officer Luke Marmoreau. You still call him Luke. He was a good partner, and it's the name he chose. Anyway, we weren't even supposed to... We were on vacation. Well, staycation. Luke got real anxious about being within driving distance of his daughter. We got the call from you two about 11.30 a.m. I think he forgot his Sarah Cole the night before. He was acting weird. The bright cold of April still haunts the May air, and frantic red and blue lick the sides of Luke's face. Sirens everywhere. Traffic into downtown Los Angeles is at a standstill, and by the time they arrive on scene, there are a dozen emergency vehicles there already. Coming up on a police barricade, he slows the car to a stop. In the passenger seat next to him is his partner, Nat, her hair chopped short at angles that complement her harsh cheeks and prominent chin. She hasn't spoken the whole drive, her searing green eyes looking anywhere but at him. Still grumpy, he'd insisted on a staycation instead of taking her to Hawaii like she'd wanted. Luke stares out the window. Up at the LA skyline, skyscrapers and cranes silhouetted against the cloudy sky, then checks his own reflection in the rearview mirror. His gray-colored contact lenses don't look natural at all, especially amid the strobing police lights. An LAPD officer knocks on Luke's window, and he comes to attention. He and Nat flash their badges, and the officer waves them through. As he pulls onto the scene itself, Luke takes his time, taking everything in. A black Cadillac limo is slanted in the middle of the street, its doors thrown wide, as though their openness might entice the abductor to bring the girl back. Around the limo, several black SUVs are stalled, and an ambulance is flashing nearby, its back doors also wide, waiting. Luke turns to Nat, watching her eyes dart around the scene, taking in every detail. At last, he breaks the silence that's been their passenger all morning. You ever have one of those everything dreams? Where you just understand everything you've ever wondered about? Good and evil, love and destiny, time, space, even the dream state itself, how it all fits together. I think I had one last night. I can't remember fucking any of it. Nat looks at him with a cocked eyebrow. You know we forget like 90% of our dreams. Nat's finger subconsciously rubs her bottom lip and her eyes go still, focusing on thoughts only she can see, staring just south of dead ahead, which she lovingly calls the Eureka spot. It's weird though, I forget them all whenever you stay over. He had been staying over a lot lately. There should be a word for that. The forgetting of dreams. Life? Ouch. Too real? How about dreamnesia? Much better. Headcanon accepted. Speaking of forgetting, next time we manage to schedule time off together, your staycations can eat a dick. We could be sipping margaritas on a beach in Maui right now, celebrating Lay Day instead of dealing with this shit. You can quit rubbing it in whenever's convenient. Luke pulls up to the ambulance and glances towards the limo, where a bald Secret Service agent is being hoisted onto a gurney. Dozens of LAPD officers, Homeland Security, and FBI agents are strewn about, and several crime scene photographers are dancing through the scene, crouching and lunging and kneeling and tiptoeing, as Nikons and cannons click and flash. Think the Secret Service actually lost the Kennedy girl? Luke kills the engine. I think if they hadn't, they'd be investigating this, not us. Nat throws open the passenger side door, and after adjusting her black blazer, steps onto the scene. Luke scrambles out after her. But Secret Service is homeland. Technically, this should fall under the Inspector General's jurisdiction. I think if we're here, someone must suspect this is bigger than just homeland security. 
As Luke adjusts his tie, he recognizes a few federal higher-ups and makes the requisite micro-head nods before coming up on a small group of people near the limo who don't seem quite so run-of-the-mill. He meets the eye of a man in his mid-forties, tall, with broad shoulders and peppered hair. The broad-shouldered man interrupts his present conversation with a lanky young man in an expensive-looking maroon suit and addresses Luke and Nat. You two must be from Fed IA. I was just saying you'd be taking point on this. Kevin Kinfield, Secretary of Homeland Security. He shakes each of their hands in turn. Thank you, sir. Officer Luke Marmoroth. Officer Nat DeVore. Pleasure, sir. I'd hope for officers with more experience in the field, but Usford and Tyndale assure me you two are the best. Let's hope they're not wrong. Kinfield motions for them to follow him, and with an extended hand, indicates the bald Secret Service agent on the gurney, two paramedics examining his bloody shoulder wound. Meet Tomas Esperanza, Rosemary Kennedy's Secret Service detail. Divider was down when the abductor appeared, and I quote, out of thin air. Esperanza was then shot through the shoulder from behind. His partner, Krista Mendelssohn. A second gurney, this one with an occupied body bag. Died a hero. Luke looks back and forth between the two gurneys, then to the limo and the surrounding SUVs. How exactly did they snatch her from the motorcade? I've seen the specs. These cars are bulletproof monsters. Kinfield motions towards the man in the maroon suit and the small group of people around him who appear to be his subordinates. That's what these fine people are here to help figure out. This is Jack Meridian, director at the Center of Neurological Capacity Harnessing. Meridian appears to be Luke's age, about 5'10 and pale-skinned with an artfully messy mop of dark hair. The suit is tailored, and Luke has a feeling the flashy wardrobe isn't the only thing Meridian has to put on in the morning. He has cold eyes, void of everything but calculation, and a lopsided lupine grin that is both compelling and unnerving. He extends a gloved hand, and Luke shakes it, the leather well-worn. Meridian's posse is made up of a young African-American girl in a black blazer with gold lining and black jeans tucked into boots. She has a hard jaw, but currently looks frightened, large eyes vacillating restlessly around the scene, at Meridian, at the limo, at the ambulance, at the reporters gathering in the distance. Anywhere, it seems, but at the man right beside her, the one in white. The man in white is clean-faced and appears to be in his 30s, but could be 40 or even 50. Some people in the city never age, though perhaps it's an effect of the man's wardrobe. He wears black leather shoes with white slacks, a white top hat, frock coat, waistcoat, a black shirt beneath, and a blood-red cravat at his throat, like a poisonous spider posing as an illusionist from the turn of the 20th century. There's definitely something wrong with the man's leather-clad hands, and Luke's thoughts gravitate towards arachnids for the second time in as many seconds. Nat is still shaking Meridian's hand when Luke interrupts. I'm sorry, what organization are you with? The Center of Neurological Capacity Harnessing, but it's pronounced conch. Welcome to the task force, officers. And did anyone explain to you what the organization known as Conch actually was? I'm pretty sure Kinfield didn't have clearance to know what Conch was, but you sure as shit didn't tell us, so we assume the details of who we were working with were less urgent than finding the president's daughter. And even though we were technically leading the investigation, it was made clear Conch had priority access to this and any related crime scenes. Reason being, they had a specialist. Officers, I'd like you to meet Senior Deputy Agent Kagame Sakayumi, our foremost translimal forensics expert. A petite young woman steps out of the Cadillac limousine, wearing a large black leather mask with glass eyepieces and a large beak like a bird, the kind of mask medieval doctors wore during the plague years, but she quickly removes it from her head. She is Japanese, older than the other girl, but younger than Meridian, and wears a navy blue blazer, sleeves rolled up, and black leather gloves. She takes a moment to pack the plague mask into a metal case on the pavement, along with a plastic evidence bag, sealed and apparently empty. For a few seconds, she pauses, eyes distant in her own eureka spot. Moment of revelation over, she shuts the metal case and snaps the locks on it before picking it up and joining the group, ignoring everyone but Meridian. Sir, the only fingerprints belong to Rosemary, Mendelssohn, and Esperanza. Two breaches inside, somehow stationary relative to the vehicle. We should notify Dr. Anken and bring it in for further Wait. testing. You want to take the limo back to your labs, Kevin? He'd rather take this up with our boss. No, no. I'm not protesting, just, uh, just clarifying. I'll, uh, I'll make it happen. Good. 
We can call on our way back. Let Dr. Anken know it's coming. Thank you, Kagami. Officer Marmoroth and Devore from Fed IA are our lead on this little task force, clearance level 10. Please cooperate with them in whatever capacity they require. Sakayumi gives them a pleasant smile and nods, tightening her grip on the metal case. Consider me at your disposal, officers. Forgive me, Senior Deputy Sakayume? Am I saying that right? That mask, what's it for? Sakayumi glances at Jack, who nods at her. She sets the case down on the ground, springs the clasps, and opens it, revealing the plague mask. The glass in the lenses utilize a spectrographical technology developed by Kanch to detect transliminal breaches. Sorry, the director mentioned that word earlier. Transliminal? Crossing planes of existence. Two successive breaches were made inside the limo. One to enter and one to escape with the Kennedy girl. Would you like to see? Luke looks to Kinfield, who raises his eyebrows, resigned. He nods, and Kagami hands Luke the mask. Close up, he sees the mask is handcrafted, the leather is still relatively stiff. There is a sleek coolness to it, something flirtatious, the same pull that draws Luke to motorcycles or high ledges. Certain individuals have quirks in their neurology, an extra capacity that allows for sensory travel through and the manipulation of said other plane. Like the astral plane? Don't be absurd. If the astral plane were real, the CIA would have hijacked it back in the 60s and the Cold War would have been over before you could say motherland. Ahem. Apologies. Please continue. Sakayumi helps slip the mask over Luke's head, fastening a buckle around the back. Our organization works with these unique individuals to exercise and harness their advanced capacity. Inside the mask, the world is painted in yellows and golds, and everything wobbles a little, as though viewed from hot pavement. (coughs) The fuck's in this thing? It smells weird. Like The mask is equipped with a number of somatic flowers, herbs, stimulants, and psychotropic compounds. They help keep the mind open to the other side, to the truth. She takes Luke's hand and guides him to the open doors of the limo. Please, look around as much as you'd like, but touch nothing. There is a deep swelling as he approaches the door and peeks his head inside. Two gashes of bright indigo light hover mid-air, completely still amidst the limo's shakiness. The swelling grows, and Luke coughs again, <coughs> louder. <coughs> Meridian is saying something, but it seems far away, unimportant. See? Do you see? But you didn't get to try in the mask yourself. No, sir. Do you think whatever was in that mask may have caused a bad reaction with your partner's brain chemistry? It definitely had a reaction, but I think maybe Luke needed that for what we were dealing with. Luke yanks off the mask and glances around the limo. The gashes in the air are gone, the limo itself no longer is shaking. Meridian snatches the mask back between his gloved fingers before Luke can say a word, and Sakayumi returns it to the metal case, snapping the lock shut. Jack turns to face a bewildered Luke, while Kagami takes the metal case and heads towards an SUV nearby. Out of the corner of his eye, Luke sees the man in white get into the back of a second SUV he feels certain belongs to Homeland Security. Secretary Kinfield can give you our information. We'll be in touch with whatever we find. Come on, Claire. Meridian puts a hand on the young black girl's shoulder to lead her away, and she flinches, then dutifully follows. Did you trust him? Meridian? Fuck no especially once we found out who his favorite deputy was. She was good. Fooled us into thinking something shady was going on, had the micro-expressions down and everything. But she wasn't scared. She was bait. Claire Swanson sits at a table, video recording beside the investigators. She expected an empty, gray interrogation room, like in the movies, but this appears to be the white investigator's office. There are a few certificates and framed college degrees and plaques on the walls, but also bookshelves decorated with college football trophies. She nearly laughs out loud at those. The white investigator, Captain James Tyndale, has a double chin and a gut that can't be hidden no matter how saggy his gray suit is. Claire is suddenly thinking about elephants. Deputy Agent Swanson. You've been hailed by your fellow agents as Director Meridian's rising star. I imagine you two must be at least a little close. So I'd like you to tell me about him. What was it like? Him taking you under his wings so young, right out of Lafayette Juvenile Detention Facility. Let me ask you something. Y'all believe in soulmates? 
No answer from Double Chin or the female investigator with the receding hairline, her bronze skin slightly lighter than Claire's. Claire hates when people avoid her questions. Fucking rude. Well, my daddy once told me soulmates ain't necessarily romantic, but each is vital, quintessential to the other. Enough cosmic codependency for the universe to set two spirits on two parallel paths, each cyclically intersecting the other. I believe I've been on a collision course with the director for a long time, even before all this with the ODA. She pauses, gauging their reactions, watching them force themselves to remain expressionless at the mention of the hot topic. Five heads' lips pucker like a sphincter. I mean, that's what y'all are asking about, right? Rosie Kennedy, the Order of the Dreaming Awake, people claiming to be wizards and shit, Gregory Blythe, that bitch gal vixen making y'all look like a bunch of fools. You track her down yet? We'll get to all that gal vixen, Gregory Blythe, and the ODA eventually. Right now, we're just trying to get a feel for Conch, specifically Meridian. You first met him during your incarceration, not after. Is that correct? We've heard some very interesting stories about him. I believe the term evil genius has been used. (laughs) Evil? Such pejorative, hypocritical bullshit coming from your mouths. Yes, the director is smart. He sees patterns intuitively knows how things can be best put to use. Pragmatic as fuck. Let's see, I first met him after I was at Lafayette a while. My mama stopped coming, couldn't bear to look at me anymore. But one day I had a visitor. Didn't recognize the name, but soon as I laid eyes on him, I knew him. We were kindred. Carried himself with the confidence of a true believer, like them Baptist ministers I grew up with wolves and sheepskin. Nothing kills wolves in nature except people, the most dangerous animals God had the audacity to make. We are a virus writ large. Most people just don't want to admit it. The director, though, he was true to his nature as a person. A dangerous fucking virus dressed in a wolf suit. And what did you two talk about when he came to visit? Oh, you know, usual stuff. Asked why I did what I did and how I came to believe the things I did. But then he asked if the ritual worked. Ain't nobody else concerned themselves with that. Most only care about the blood that was spilled. Like them Turner Burns who were all, Jesus died for you. He suffered and died for you. Like they're trying to guilt you into believing. Yeah, no shit he died. Assholes. That's how sacrifice works. And did it work? Your sacrifice? I'm 21 years old, and I get paid to do things most people can only hope to dream of. So you tell me if it worked. Hey, can I get a cold drink? All this jibber-jabbering got my throat all dry. Thought I saw a machine on the way in. It's out of everything but Pepsi. Well, that'd be great, Gwendolyn. Five head huffs as she gets up from her chair, knocking her Princeton class of O2 ring on the table as she stands. After a silent exchange with Double Chin, she turns and exits the room. Claire doesn't miss a beat. Anyway, on May Day, Jack was a total mess. You call him Jack? We were kindred. Didn't you hear me? He took me under his wing, always told me I reminded him of someone he sacrificed. And did that scare you? Not really. Sacrifice is blood magic. Demand something of value be given. Value is subjective, a sacred truth in the heart of the sacrificer. Jenny was my best friend. That's why I had to sacrifice her, because I valued her. Even if I did think she was a spoiled, stuck-up cunt, but Samantha... If Jack chose her to sacrifice, he must have loved her something fierce. She must have been amazing. Claire Swanson drives away from the crime scene, her eyes occasionally darting up to check on Jack in the rearview mirror. Next to him, Kagami also glances anxiously in Jack's direction. Everything's gone to shit. On Mayday, too. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Claire almost smiles at his pathetic French. It reminds her of home a little, but he knows it would. He's trying to elicit a feeling in her, a fondness and comfort. He wants something from her. That almost makes her smile all over again, but she keeps her face still and her mouth shut, refusing to respond. Sir, do you think it's them? 
The Order of the Dreaming Awake? If it awake? weren't for that eyewitness Secret Service agent and the plague mask in the fucking mirror, I'd say yes, Kagame. Definitely the Order's doing. But his testimonies could lead those IA officers right to our door. But the Order would know. <sighs> Why would they do that? We've kept our side of the agreement. Mostly. Kagame, when IA gets here, we'll need an investigation of our own. Fresh meat we can throw at them when the time is right. Something's rotten in the state of Denmark. Sir? We're being set up. We have a mole. Have you heard anything? Seen anything? Claire? How do you know I'm not the mole? <laughs> Please. Am I off probation, sir? For fuck's sake. We are a division of the United States government. A secret division, yes. But in order to appease the occasional oversight inspection, rare as they are, I have to at least maintain the appearance of order within our psychopact facilities. Speaking of which, well done with the whole freight and doobie act you pull in in front of the IA officers. I think they'll bite. Care to fill me in on why I'm acting a do-eyed damsel? Soon enough. In the meantime, I'd like you to lead this investigation. Find our mole quickly and quietly. Why not Kagami? She's the logical... Senior Deputy Sakayumi has enough on her plate right now. This is all you, Claire. Claire nods in silent consent. You still want me on the mandatory Mayday mission? Feel free to look up the word mandatory. After the commencement ceremony, your team is going down for reconnaissance only. Ask around for anything on one Lord Duma. Kagami turns sharply to Jack, mouth tight, and Claire pretends not to notice. Duma's a big player in the OP, reported missing. That should distract the locals from Pontus' mission. Which is... All I can tell you is it involves blowing shit up. The fresh temple recruits from Devil's Night will make up your team. Try not to shoot any of them this time. Though I think Ralph might actually be into that kind of thing. What? Getting shot? Dying. He has a uniquely urgent Thanatos about him. Preliminal agent Ralph Parnes had gotten in her way last time she had taken him on a training mission. Yeah, that's why I like him. He ain't scared of shit. And he doesn't flinch away from pain. He's a valuable asset. He destroyed a valuable asset. Samantha was the most valuable Sir, fucking asset we had. you would've had to sacrifice her one way or another. What? You think you could outwit the devil? Jack, you designed Temple to separate the wheat from the chaff. And it worked. Samantha and her sister just didn't make the cut, and it's all there is to it. <sighs> Sir? Fine. But if friendly fire can't be avoided, at least try for a headshot. So I get my big-ass gun back? And your knives. You know I hate denying artists their brushes. Claire's grip tightens on the steering wheel, and she allows herself a smile. Nat keeps an eye on Concha's SUV as it slowly distances itself from the crime scene. How the hell does a group of charlatan motherfuckers like that get a federal sanction? The Undersecretary for Science and Technology is on a plane from Boston right now. She'll be able to fill you in on the bureaucracy of it, but Who I... is the quiet one? Never got an introduction. That would be Deputy Agent Claire Marasa Swanson, youngest conch agent ever deputized. Claire Viridian's Swanson? rising star. Why does that name sound so familiar? No, not the scared one. The man. The man in white. Nat casts a meaningful look in Kinfield's direction, who pauses in his tracks en route to the open ambulance nearby. The only man from Conch was wearing maroon, and he was hardly quiet. Luke stares a second before deciding she's being serious. There was no man in white. Christ, not even lunchtime, and already he's questioning his reality. Yeah. Right, sorry, coffee hasn't kicked in yet. And you believe it was his Seroquel deficiency talking? At the time, I did. I mean, it's an antipsychotic for fuck's sake. It literally tranquilizes delusions. I was a little concerned, not just for Luke or the case or our careers or my personal safety, but for Rosie. I mean, whoever had her wasn't going to wait for us to be ready. Neither was Homeland Security. Look, the White House will need to issue a statement in the next couple hours. And what they cannot say is Rosemary Kennedy was pulled through a breach in the fabric of the universe. So, this was a failure on part of the Secret Service to follow procedure. Someone's head needs to be offered up on a platter. Pin it on the dead hero if you have to, but do it soon. And talk to Esperanza before he bleeds out. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a conference call with an extremely panicked father-in-chief. Kinfield walks away with his phone to his ear. 
Luke and Nat take out their phones and approach Tomas Esperanza, the surviving Secret Service agent. In his mid-thirties, Esperanza has a bleeding bandaged shoulder and a paramedic is strapping him into the ambulance. Luke can tell by the man's frantic inability to sit still that Esperanza is reeling from the death of his partner in a big way. Shock. Guilt. He knows the signs and lets Nat do most of the talking. Hey, Tomas. I know you've been through a lot and you're probably sick of answering questions, but... I want to do everything I can to help. Just that bullet hit and all. My training completely fucking vanished. I mean, I've watched Krista bleed out. I watched it happen. Even the morphine won't Did you see anything in the limo? A shadow? A reflection? Anything you can remember would be a big help, Tomas. Try closing your eyes. Really strain your memory and visualize the abduction. Just the indigo flash. The two gunshots in rap- rapid succession. Rosie screaming. Uh, like a muffled grunt. Then another indigo flash and the limo. Uh, the limo was quiet. Luke makes a notation in his phone. Any idea what accounted for the muffled grunt? Muffled, maybe because of a mask? Esperanza blinks several times. How did you- What'd it look like? Come on, Tomas, you're losing blood. Uh, I just barely saw it. Black leather, I think, like a, like a, a big bird mask. Luke and Nat exchange a look. I remember thinking it was a sh- shitty mask. It, uh, it looked too big. The neck was, p- it was a woman. But it was dark and... I'm sorry, officers. Just a split we gotta second. get him out of here. Get him a transfusion or he's gonna bleed to death. Luke nods to the paramedic and claps Esperanza on the arm. The United States government thanks you for your courage and your service. They hop out of the ambulance and begin walking back towards the limo together. Behind them, the paramedic closes the doors and the ambulance pulls away. Okay, so far we've got the president's daughter missing. Holes in reality at the scene... A secret branch of the government that deals in holes in reality, which they detect with special plague masks. And now, according to the only breathing eyewitness, the female suspect, coincidentally, wore a mask matching the one used by said secret branch of the government. Speaking of which, I didn't want to bring this up in front of Kinfield, but I can't say nothing. It's my case too, Luke. Next time someone says, here, check out these holes in the universe, be sure I get a fucking look too, partner. Yeah, I'm... I'm sorry, I didn't... I mean, I know it's no excuse, but... (laughs) Holes in the fucking universe, man. Rude. Check your privilege. I'm truly sorry. Patriarchy aside, it is kind of super fucking rad that our lives have led us to a point where we're investigating holes in reality. I mean, we, of all people, get to peek behind the curtain and... They both take their phones back out and begin photographing the crime scene. Fuck! Luke, do you have any idea how lucky we are? If there is such a thing as luck, this is anything but. Did you talk about that sort of thing a lot with him? Luck, fate, philosophy... That's your pillow talk? Before I decided to end it, yes. We talked about everything. The cult his parents used to be in, his weirdo stalker in high school, his going into hiding, his sister's death, our smallness in the face of existence. I mean... You can't tell me you don't wonder if there's a grand design, or if God is dead, or just doesn't give a shit, or if we've lived these same shitty little lives a thousand times before. Oh, come on, Luke. Don't be all sour grapes. We could find her. We could be heroes. Forever and ever. They're not going to let us be heroes on this one, Nat. This is going to shine light in corners that some very powerful people probably don't want anyone looking in. Holes in the universe are just window dressing. This is about Kennedy, somehow. No one climbs that high without digging a few graves along the way. (sighs) We really should have gone to Hawaii. You should fucking listen to me. So what, we're looking for a political enemy of Kennedy's? Maybe. Females are statistically less prone to committing acts of violence. Whoever did this had nothing to lose. She's already lost everything. I hate to admit it, but I have no trouble picturing Audrey doing something like this if she was driven to. As in your wife, Audrey? But she's so... What could possibly drive Audrey to kidnap someone's daughter? Same thing that could drive me. Our daughter. 
but that seems too neat. I mean, I do think we're looking for uh, a mother or maybe a sister or paramour, but it's it's more than that. I can feel it. You vote for the guy? Kennedy, I mean. No. I always thought he was kind of a douche. Yeah, me too. I feel sorry for him now, though. Luke snaps a picture of skid marks from where the limo swerved out of formation. Most powerful man in the world and is completely powerless to act like a man. Nat snaps a picture of the driver's seat. Bullet hole through it. Blood everywhere. What do you mean? Something happens when you become a parent. The hard shell you've built up just kind of cracks in this spring of love like you've never felt before in your life. For anyone or anything comes bursting out of you like a raging geyser. He pauses. Blood spatter on the pavement. Heidi's only four. Objectively, I haven't had her that long, but I would nuke the planet to a fucking crisp if someone took her from me. Near the blood is some broken glass and a bullet shell. Kennedy's had his daughter, what, five times as long? His natural impulses are going to get in the way of doing his job. He's going to have to recuse himself. Invoke the 25th Amendment. Nat's face sours. And put Lawrence Dunham in the Oval? Yeah, excuse me while I move to Canada. Luke stoops down to examine a paper something in the gutter. Too neat to be a random scrap of garbage. There's an intricate design on one side, and it is glossy to the touch. When he flips it over, his heart sinks. Shit. A tarot card. The magician. That's not supposed to be here. He got away from all that. Heidi, his sister, got killed for that. He's Luke Marmoroth now, not... Wait, did he take his Seroquel last night? Fuck, what if this is one of his delusions? What if the magician isn't in his hand at all? Without putting it into an evidence bag, he slips the tarot card into his inner coat pocket. So, during your relationship with him, did he ever discuss his mental illness with you? He broke with reality a bit when his sister Heidi died, years back. He never fully recovered. Wore it on his sleeve, though. Dead weight. <laughs> Literally. But on May Day, he felt particularly unhinged. We're looking for a monster. Put a call into the office. We want any dirt on the Kennedys. Immediate family first, then extended, then closest friends, etc. Plus any foreign interests who may want to put pressure on the president. Russia, China, France, whoever the fuck's running the Congo at the moment. Party got LAPD sifting through the crazy basket. Anything to do with plague masks and anyone local or on Etsy or Amazon who makes them. Anything on people disappearing into thin air. Incidents involving anyone on conscious payroll. I swear to God, I've heard Claire Swanson's name before. I just... I don't trust them. Conch. They're not who they say they are. Are any of us who we say we are? Dream State Episode 1 was written and directed by Matt McCarthy and featured the additional talents of Jonte Godlock, David Bethke, Anne Parma, Kate Newman, John Burgos, Slade James, Eon Song, Adria Young, and Nicholas Ramsey. Music and sound design by Matt McCarthy. Extra special thanks to Mariah McCarthy for helping to make this episode possible. Dream State will always be a free podcast. If you would like to give back and help Dream State continue, please head over to patreon.com slash dreamstate. As a patron, you can get early access to episodes, behind-the-scenes extras, as well as other exclusive content. Thank you again for listening. Dream well.